Thank you for joining us for another Hagley History Hangout. My name is Gregory Hargreaves, Assistant Director of the Center for the History of Business, Technology, and Society at the Hagley Museum and Library in Wilmington, Delaware. Now, you know, during these history hangouts, we like to bring you some of the great work being done by scholars who have used the historical collections at the Hagley Library, especially folks who have received support from the Hagley Center in the form of research grants and fellowships of different kinds. Joining me today is Rebecca Jansen, Professor of Spanish and Comparative Literature at the University of South Carolina. Rebecca, thanks for speaking with us today. Oh, I'm so happy to be here. Oh, you're welcome. Let's start by painting with broad strokes, so to speak. What is it you're researching and writing about? Right now, I'm researching a project I've tentatively called Mining Religion. Um, it's about religious shrines that are located inside of mines in several countries in the Americas, um, in the U.S., in Mexico, Brazil, Bolivia, and Cuba. And I'm trying to figure out what is going on. Um, normally, when we think about religious practices in the United States, we think about like believing a certain number of things, but also like a house of worship, like a church, a mosque, a temple, a synagogue. Um, and of course, people engage in practices everywhere all the time, but um, mines are not one of the places that usually come to mind. It's like, oh, you have a home religious practice of whatever kind. If you're Catholic, you might have home altars to various saints, the Virgin Mary. Um, in some countries, people have things at their place of work. I had never thought of the inside of a mine, like underground, as one of those places. Um, so I came across this when I was finishing up a previous project and I thought it was really interesting. And it ha a lot of parts of this project have been written about before, so I was able to learn, but um, my curiosity was not fully satisfied. So that is why I started this project. Well, what brought your attention to it in the first place? That is a really good question. Um, so, I'm a Mexicanist. I was trained in the study of Mexican literature. That's what my dissertation and first book are on. And I've always, in that project and my subsequent monographs, um, looked at literature in conjunction with archival texts. So okay. my first book was about um, disability and biopolitics in Mexico. And so I looked at novels and short stories, but also documents from the Ministry of what kind of an equivalent would be like public health, on public education and social welfare um, and trying to see what was going on in comparison. And then my subsequent project was more archival. Um, so I've always had this interest in the past um, and also in trying to figure out things that have to do with religion. Uh, that's an impulse most people in the world have and it manifests in really different ways in different communities, even in like the same geographical location, depending on race, gender, social class, sexual orientation, whatever. Um, but it's something that people are always doing. And so that has also been part of several of my projects. My second book was about Mennonites and Mormons in Mexico. And my third book was about representations of religion, primarily Catholicism, but also Judaism and evangelical Christianity in Mexican film. So like it brought together some of the approaches I had used before and one of my ongoing areas of interest. Um, extraction is a really trendy topic right now in mm -hmm. my field of Mexican studies mm -hmm. um, and in a lot of fields. Uh, when I started this project, I became aware of a unit at the American Academy of Religion on religion and extraction. And I've participated in that this past November. Um, so it's just everywhere and the religion connection is something that is a little bit smaller, but has been traced in a whole bunch of different countries um, and different continents and many time periods. So I felt like there was enough, like I wasn't making something up out of nothing, but mm -hmm. also no one was doing exactly what I'm thinking about. So it seems like also a good time to engage in dialogue with others without worrying about doing the same thing as someone else. Mm -hmm. Sure. Yeah, that's the classic sort of uh, <laughs> scholar's tale of how we find our work, isn't it? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah. Could you, could you maybe explain a little bit more about your case studies? You mentioned um, having some in the United States, some in Mexico, and some in Brazil. Was was that correct? Yeah. Um, I will talk about the one in Mexico because it's the best researched. Okay, I am great. currently in Brazil doing some research. Um, and then I can also talk about what I hope to find 
in the Higley collections. But I'll start with Mexico. So I want to look at things from the 19th century onwards. That was a time of renewed colonial interest from the United States and Great Britain in Latin America. So this is primarily after independence from Spain and Portugal. Um, and then these companies, so it wasn't imperialism in the way of we will control your country. It was soft imperialism. We'll control all of your companies. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. And there had, like mining is one of the reasons that Spain and Portugal wanted to colonize the Americas. Um, the Caribbean, the place where the Spaniards first arrived, they found gold. They were going to get gold for the empire and win souls for God. Um, that's like a trite saying we would flesh out very slightly in an intro kind of class to Latin American culture. And I'm assuming historians do this as well. Mm -hmm. um, and then they enslaved Africans who were already experts at mining specifically to make more money. Um, several centuries later, there's all of these mining centers in the Americas. They're often named after saints, which I think is curious. Um, in the state of San Luis Potosí, so it's St. Louis, Potosí. Potosí is named after the place in Bolivia that they had gotten super rich from. Mm -hmm. um, the Silver Mountain. And I went, yes, literally. Um, and so they hoped to get as rich in San Luis Potosí and then... Mm -hmm trying to remember when the first explorations in that area, I believe were in early colonial period, 16th, 17th century. Um, after independence, or towards the end of the Spanish empire, early independence, so the early 19th century in Mexico, um, there's another kind of a second boom of mining. Um, it's not heavily industrialized in the way we think of now, but it's also not artisanal mining. I'm also not very clear on how you do artisanal mining and how that differs from prospecting. That is something mm -hmm. I hope to learn. Yeah. Um, and so when I was there this fall in a uh, state public archive, I was looking at mining documents. So like every single thing is named after a different saint. Um, and there's often churches because that is what the Spaniards did when they colonized. They put churches in chapels. And the maps are very interesting because the mining ones will show you like where minerals are supposed to be below the earth, above the earth. But older ones are not in a scale that we would use. So you can see really big churches and then things that they thought would be there. It just a different perspective on mapping than we have now. And so you can look at the same place across time. What the heck is going on? There's um in one town that is today a tourist destination, Real de Catorce, San Luis Potosí. Um, it's known for a pilgrimage to St. Francis of Assisi, who we associate in the United States with animals um, and blessing animals kind of towards the end of September. You might see that at some churches, animals outside. Um, and the church is not named after St. Francis, but the pilgrimage is to him at the Church of the Immaculate Conception of Mary. Um, and people walk through the desert. There's an indigenous pilgrimage that has been going on since time immemorial, according to anthropologists in the same place. There's hippies that do ayahuasca there. Um, so there's a lot of things happening in the Mexican desert in a place that was really famous because of mining and kind of a second wave of mining boom. Hmm. I'm like, what is going on? To get into the town as a tourist, and I was only there during like a pilgrimage time, so not sure if you have to do this all the time, but you, uh, take a horse-drawn cart through a mining tunnel, and there's a shrine to the Virgin of Guadalupe, the most important um, version of the Virgin Mary in Mexico, and some other shrines. And uh, then in the town, overlooking former mines, there's a St. Francis-themed amusement park. Just like, what even is going on? Um, mm -hmm. I think it. what I hope to do is find some materials that will tell me the answer, but as that has not yet happened, and I have looked at different types of mining deeds. I've also looked at some um, church archives and like lay associations, so associations of people who are not clergy, um, who mm -hmm. are just attending church. Um, they're really interesting, but they're also not saying why they're doing a pilgrimage. It's just what they're doing. So I don't think I'll be able to answer my true question, um, but I hope that by looking at that kind of document, 
I will be able to look at something like, oh, a St. Francis themed amusement park. There's all kinds of tourist materials from the 21st century about this. Like, how does that fit into a context of extraction? Is tourism the wave of extraction after mining? Um, does it come together with mining? I don't know. Returning to the Hagley collections, while I was mm -hmm. at the Hagley, I requested yeah. so many materials. And I have to say, it's a really different experience doing research in Latin America and at the Hagley. Hmm. Um, every archive has its own personality um, that I've been to in the US as well. But uh, the database is, I'm assuming mostly correct, like nothing was missing, or if it's not accessible, it will say that you can't access it. Um, like if documents are being restored or something. Um, so I could just look up all the countries I'm interested in and request books and request documents. Um, something that I started doing once my topic became slightly clearer um, was looking at tourism things. Tourism and mining do go together because mining and railways went together mm -hmm. in Latin mm -hmm. America and I'm assuming other parts of the world. Um, they're the wave of mining that I'm interested in and industrialization associated with railways went together and railways also facilitated travel um, mm. in it. So there are travel reports and travel guides from some of the places I want to go. Um, well, I want to go there, but also want to learn about for research. And something that's really curious to me about mining regions um, is that there's like local staff um, but there's like technical staff who are maybe engineers or something like that. And then there's staff who extract the things from the earth, but mm -hmm. then there's staff from the American company that owns the mine or British company or whatever. De and that depends on the country. Sometimes um, an American company or British company didn't have a controlling interest, but they would still usually have some kind of presence. Um, but it means that there are sometimes people who wrote letters back home and in the case of one mine in Chile, which is not part of my study, but might become part of my study um, mm -hmm. because it's really, really well documented at the Hagley. Um, there's letters that people wrote as part of like um, commemorating the mine after it had closed um, and talking about the church the miners built mm -hmm. and that like the company, which was a um, subsidiary of Bethlehem Steel and all of those files are at the Hagley because DuPont owned Bethlehem Steel. Um, you can look at the whole development of this mine. You can see pictures of the mine. Like obviously they were supposed to be for engineering things. I'm not an engineer. I'm not a historian of science, but when they're taking pictures of where the workers live, there's a picture of the church. Now, this is something I've not seen, but I'm hoping when I go back, um, Bethlehem had really significant interests. You can learn more about this on Corey Fisher Hoffman's Hagley History Hangout. 49% um, <laughs> according to her. Uh, <laughs> Thank you for the plug. <laughs> um, at, in Ecomi, a manganese mine in Brazil. Um, and to see like what is there in terms of people's memories or photographs. Um, and no one who was employed by a company, like a mining company is trying to take pictures of a crucifix in the background. But if there is a room where there's a crucifix in the background, I will find that interesting. Or in that region of Brazil, um, it's a particular version or apparition of the Virgin Mary, the Virgin mm -hmm. of Nazareth, I believe. So I'm curious if that will appear. And um, I'm curious, there's lists of people who worked in the mines, like pay lists um, mm -hmm. from some places that I looked at when I was at the Hagley in August and September. Um, and so to look at that and see usually where there's money information, you can glean other kinds of information or figure yeah. out different kinds of relationships. Like who is earning more? Why did they get a promotion? Um, how is this negotiated? Is this related to part of something? Um, and perhaps comparing those to church documents. Um, I will say in Brazil, the church documents, a little bit onerous to access, but exist and are well, like, I don't know how you say this in English. Yeah, well, like, taken care of, like, in an archive, not mm -hmm. in a 
specific church's archive in a diocesan archive or archdiocesan archive. So if a whole bunch of churches and there's staff who know about archives, not just people who love their institution, mm -hmm. which is good and important, but it's a lot easier as a researcher to go somewhere where people are used to people doing research. <laughs> um, so I think that there could be significant potential for maybe seeing overlap between annual festivals and like mining payrolls and trying to figure out what is going on. How are people making decisions together? What are people doing? Mm -hmm. um, why are they, are they just doing a religious thing? Cause it's what you do in a predominantly Catholic country or is it something else? Um, so that's what I hope to find out and mm -hmm. yeah. I'm wondering whether um, mortality is a theme here. I think so. Hang on. Someone just knocked on my door. Oh, sure. No problem. I, 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 sure. Yep. All right. Uh, I was asking, um, I wonder whether mortality is an important theme given how dangerous mining can be and the centrality of death and rebirth to uh, world religions generally, but perhaps especially Christianity. Yeah, that is also something that um, I am trying to learn more about. Um, something that's interesting in the Bolivian case, um, and perhaps other places too, is that above the mine, there's like a shrine to a particular um, version or apparition of the Virgin Mary. And under the mine, there's a shrine to El Tio de la Mina, who mm -hmm. looks very much like Christian ideas of the devil, um, like bright red, extremely phallic symbols. You give mm -hmm. offerings of like cigarettes and alcohol. Um, to him, but you have to do both. And mm -hmm. so it's like this person is, this figure is ushering you into the underworld. Um, and in Brazil, um, what I have learned, but I'm not confident about is like, mm, how do you say this? The different, I'm sorry about the background noise. Um, the different versions of the Virgin Mary also have like an African descendant god or goddess attached to them. And the ones that are particularly revered by Afro-Brazilian miners are associated with death, mm. um, with metals, and um, yeah, with with destruction and creation. Mm -hmm. um, like different, not they're not all in the same uh, being, but that's totally part of it. So like what is going on, what I think is really interesting is that mining is a predominantly male job hmm. um so it's groups of men often in isolated areas <laughs> um like where i am in brazil today not super isolated but if there wasn't a highway extremely isolated or like this mine i want to visit tomorrow you can take a public bus there now because mm -hmm. there's a highway it's like 10 minutes away from the town where i'm in um so they're in an isolated area a bunch of men and then there's the woman is the virgin mary i also assume they're sex workers that's seems likely mm -hmm. um but like what is she doing for them affectively um is it like a kind of caring for them and labor protection that's one of my initial hypotheses um yeah is it ushering you into the underworld and then like welcoming you back into the land of the living when your shift is over yeah. that's at least how i feel at work so and like <laughs> i work in an office <laughs> yeah, sure. so I think there's something really there. Mm -hmm. I just got this book from the library. It's called Sister Death by Beatrice Marovich. Um, and it's just about ideas of death in Western philosophy and theology, just. Um, so primarily referring to Christianity and Catholicism, which for the purposes of my project is really handy. So I'm curious to read that book and see how that might help me understand the things I think that these groups of miners are doing based mm -hmm. on the information that's available about them. Um, yeah, like, what? What are they doing? Why are they doing it? There's also a lot of documented influence of Catholicism in Latin America and resistance to mining like today. Today, most mining interests in Latin America are Canadian and mm -hmm. I'm Canadian. I think that might also be why I'm interested mm -hmm. um, in this topic. And 
Um, so like, what are these Catholic lay associations doing for people or the use of religious rhetoric, sometimes also indigenous religious traditions? Mm -hmm. um, that's been well documented in Peru and Ecuador, which are definitely not going to be part of my study. It's too many countries. Um, <laughs> but looking at what people have done, and in Mexico, curiously, right-wing Catholic organizations might have been involved in resistance to mining. Usually, <laughs> right-wing Catholic organizations are involved in um, resistance to public education or public health measures mm. uh, in, in Mexico. And so this seems just really unusual and mm -hmm. of course i find that interesting but yeah like what what is drawing these people how are they drawing on their religious tradition and an existing association of people who already know each other who are already like in some kind of community with each other um i also want to because of the bethlehem steel files being at the Hegley, um look at some of the miners who were irish american Mm -hmm. I don't know that much about Irish traditions, but this fall I was at a conference and it was like interdisciplinary arts of the present. And someone was talking about mm, ideas about dwarves being in mines and different mythical creatures. So like uh, Irish Americans are also predominantly Catholic, which is why it works. Like there's um, not the same types of inculturated religion or syncretic religion as we see maybe in Brazil or Bolivia that I mentioned, but like there's something going on with mm -hmm. a not Catholic tradition and a Roman Catholic tradition with the same people. So like, and doing a cursory examination of churches in the Archdiocese of Philadelphia, which I use just as a placeholder because I assume that some of the churches that would be people who worked at Bethlehem Steel or um, could have attended, mm -hmm. there are, primarily to female saints, like sodalities of something, but there are, some of them are exclusively men's groups, some of them are women's groups, some of them are whoever. First re-examination. So I think there's something there too with mm -hmm. what the official Catholic church says people should be doing, what people are actually doing, mm -hmm. and how that also differs regionally. Um, so when we think about Irish American minors, you can think about really uh, militant unionization efforts. So I'm also curious if their religious beliefs play into that as well, or if it's simply a response to mining conditions. Um, mm. I think that there are a lot of things that I can learn still for this project. Um, and I'm really excited to go back to the Hegley because now I have an idea of some of the kinds of documents, first of all, that are there. Mm -hmm. um, and they were really illuminating were the ones from Chile, but um, it also helps that I find reading Spanish and English very easy, so. Um, I could read all of the materials, like I'm a Spanish professor, that's why. Mm -hmm. uh, but um, I think that there's the same, now that I know kind of what keywords and stuff to look for, um, I can hopefully request some documents that will help me learn more, especially about the Brazilian case and mm -hmm. um, the US case, possibly also Cuba. Um, mm -hmm. Bethlehem mm -hmm. Steel had iron mines there uh, and there is really interesting um, shrines to Our Lady of Mount Carmel, uh, mm. but of copper, mm -hmm. La Señora del Cobre. Um, and it is pretty similar African descendant traditions that are revered in Brazil, but to different Catholic saints. So mm -hmm. I think that there is a lot of potential and yeah, yeah. the Bethlehem steel documents, like people have looked at them, um, but I think only one person has looked at their connection to Latin America. So that is very helpful for me to give sure. me like a little orientation, <laughs> but that together with the research that I already did at the Higley hopefully means that I'll be able to um, figure out how to answer some of my questions or what kinds of questions I can answer by looking at the documents that are out there. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, so I think it'd be really cool. Well, we love to support multiple visits, so be sure to apply for funding. Uh, I'm wondering um, where in Brazil are you? Are you in Minas? I am. I'm in Oro Preto right now. Uh -huh. um, it is carnival next week at the beginning oh my. of Lent. Very cool. Yeah. Apparently, this is one of the top 10 places to do carnival. Um, I believe I correctly assessed the situation that most things would be closed around that. And I was like, <laughs> mm -hmm. well, I want to 
I went to um, a church archive earlier this week, and I'm looking at some things here in town next week. And then I'm going to another town, Diamantina. Um, so for diamond mining, I guess. Um, next, after the Lent begins, I was like, well, I could go to Rio, but I'm going to go there later. Um, the real plus minus of Brazilian archives is so much is digitized. I think that is what they might have focused on um, in the pandemic. Mm -hmm. And Portugal has also done that, especially its colonial archives. So people in its former colonies, I think, can like look and see what is there without needing to travel to Portugal, mm -hmm. um, which is really cool. And it does mean that I can have a little bit more time to go to some of the smaller, like perhaps yeah. trickier to access or just shorter hours because they're staffed by people um, from an archdiocese, not like a full-time archive. So yeah, I think it'll be cool. I think Carnival might, um, I think it'll be an interesting experience that I will have. And when Absolutely. I'm at the Hagley in April, I can tell you about it. Great. <laughs> <laughs> I look forward to hearing more. Um, last sort of thematic question. Um, it just, uh, the more I think about this notion of religion and mining, um, the more the stark difference between above ground worlds and below ground worlds seems to be relevant. Um, and I just wonder uh, whether um, an overarching theme might be that there are different powers uh, at work above ground and below ground, and they must be propitiated in some way or recognized in the proper way. Um, oh, it, defin definitely the proper way part. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So do you think there's, there's something to that? I think so. Um, I taught a class on this topic last spring uh -huh. um, and my students were like, how can people be Catholic and also worship El Tio de la Mina? And I was like, well, I mean, anyone can do anything. Like <laughs> you can't put a limit on what someone does in their life or what they believe. Mm -hmm. Um, but I think so much, especially, well, I teach in the American South in South Carolina, so for evangelical Christians, Catholics aren't Christian um, in the year 2023, which is an interesting thing to learn. Um, and so I think that as a response to that, Catholicism in the South is mm, very not Latin American, like very, became in a way more similar to Protestant practices. Mm -hmm. um, so less mm -hmm. emphasis on the things I think are so interesting about Catholicism and that let people have a full sensorial experience. Um, and I think, so I think that's part of it that you can, I mean, anyone can do anything, but also it's like, where are you in the world? Mm -hmm. So like, who should you be doing something for? Um, like what day is it? What time of year is it? Um, and I am hoping to learn more about that. Uh, because I really think there is something to that, like who's ushering you into the world, like with your family, with your friends, and who is ushering you like possibly to death. Mm -hmm. Right. Well, yeah. Rebecca, thank you so much for sharing your work. It's just been a great conversation. I really appreciate it. Oh, this was so fun. Thank you. Oh, you're welcome. For the audience, if you would like more Hagley History Hangouts, more information on the Center for the History of Business, Technology, and Society at the Hagley Museum and Library, join us online. You can visit hagley.org. That's H-A-G-L-E-Y dot O-R-G. Don't be a stranger. <laughs>